And welcome back to the Constitutionals Podcast. I'm your host, Chad White. If you didn't know, this is the premiere podcast for the website, cpluscomedy.com. It's a website. Go there. I'm not wearing a watch. I just realized that. Okay. That's unfortunate. I typically love to wear a watch, but uh, right now, the one of them is charging, and then the other two that don't require charging are sitting on the, uh, the table where they live. <laughs> 257. Hey, let's talk about this. I got a new interview out before this episode, and it is uh, with Jenny Zagrino. She's a comedian, and she just put out her latest stand up special called Gen Z, and it's going to become an album at some point on April 14th for available for purchase and available for uh, streaming if you just want to listen to it. But right now, it is out video style. On YouTube.com slash Comedy Central stand-up? I don't know. It's it's Comedy Central's YouTube page. And you can watch it there. It's got a lot of views. Check it out. Gen Z. All right. Let's move on. <laughs> I already gave that. I gave enough plugs in the last one. I just recorded it. If you want behind-the-scenes footage of what I'm doing right now. <laughs> if you're watching the video... I'm uh, trying to cover up my wrist because I'm not wearing a watch. <laughs> it feels naked. How often do I record this show without a watch on? Not often. How often do you see it? Not often. What's been going on in my life? Nothing. Let's get on with the first story. <laughs> this comes from The Hollywood Reporter written by Alex Weprin. Anderson Cooper is going to host a Sunday primetime series for CNN. Now, if you if you watch a lot of news magazine shows, you see that Anderson Cooper, while he does have a contractual obligation with CNN, he also moonlights as a contributor on 60 Minutes, the premier news magazine show that is on television right now. I think... That uh, that CNN is doing so, so right now. The the new show is going to premiere April sixteenth, and it's called the Whole Story. Sunday nights on CNN eight p.m. I think that CNN is trying to wrangle in, or Warner is trying to wrangle in its personalities and trying to give them more direction when it comes to things that they can do at the mothership. Anderson Cooper is a great broadcaster, and he's been doing this 60 Minutes contri- contribution thing for a very long time. Uh, but this just seems as as though as a way for for CNN to just kind of get control of of what people are doing for their competitors. Now, it's not like he was w- working for CBS News. It was just, I mean, t- 60 Minutes is a CBS property, it's a Paramount property, which owns CBS, but. It's not as it's not as though he's working for CBS News. Like Oprah is not, Oprah contributed to sixty Minutes, and she also appears on uh, CBS Mornings in order to promote her book of the month for the month book of the month club or whatever. Oprah's book of the month, <laughs> whatever that is. So I don't I don't I I don't know why they. I mean I, this this has to be something that was in the works for a minute. Uh, the one of the most unfortunate things about it, though, is that the same thing can happen for their new 9 p.m. hour that's happening Monday through Friday. I don't know if it happens on Saturdays, but CNN Prime or Primetime, whatever it's called. Uh, one of the biggest issues about that is is that CNN is a 24 hour news channel, news service. And if something big happens, God forbid, but news happens. And so if something big happens, then they're going to have to preempt the 9 p.m. hour or this, and now really the whole story, the 8 p.m. hour. Uh, Or, in fact, they might just have to get rid of that hour altogether for that night, and then people aren't going to be able to watch the whole story. Or they're not going to be able uh, to watch, uh, uh, you know, the 9 p.m. thing. Okay, I'm writing down the title. I said it was News Happens. Chris Litch said in a statement powered by CNN's unmatched global journalism operation, the whole story goes behind the headlines touching every continent and corner of the planet as we bring our viewers into the heart of the essential stories of our time. 
And uh, I mean, again, it's just going to be it's going to be a similar show to 60 Minutes or a really just any news magazine style show. Lich said he wanted to add a news magazine uh, to CNN Sunday lineup at last year's Warner Bros. Discovery Upfront, citing a goal to give CNN journalists a primetime platform to tell their stories. And it's going to be a it's going to be a platform for someone to tell stories that they can't tell during you know Jake Tapper's show or during Wolf Blitzer's two shows uh, or hours, I think, uh, and in CNN this morning and, and and the rest of the the shows that they aired during the day, uh, but. To to be stifled down to this one hour, I mean, it's kind of a blessing and a curse because you're you're able to talk about the the things that you've wanted to for such a long time, but now it's just, I mean, again, what happens if you know there's a there's another earthquake in Haiti or if there's civil unrest? in the Middle East or, you know, and, and it, and it requires them to take the next four hours out and talk about it versus on CBS, they can do 20 minutes and then go, we're back to your regular schedule programming, which is 60 minutes. And then, uh, or, and then you can watch, you know, 60 minutes on Paramount plus the next day. The new series isn't exactly, uh, the news magazine show as we want it to be, but it's going to, uh, uh, apparently each episode is only going to have one long feature. So I wonder if that means they're going to talk about, so an hour long is really 40 minutes, uh, with, with commercials. So, I, so, you know, it could, it could just be, you know, they're talking about, uh, um, uh, I don't know what, what are, what are things that the news talks about? Flint, Michigan. The water in Flint, Michigan, because we got to hear that about that because it hasn't been you know fixed for the past sixteen years or whatever. Cooper, of course, has for years pulled double duty on primetime anchor on CNN as a correspondent for Sunday CBS News Magazine sixty minutes. The new program will not impact his duties for CBS, a source familiar with the matter said. So, it, I mean, he it, it could be like a first look deal essentially. It could be a deal that. You know, he he could pitch a story to CBS. They might not want it. He could pitch a longer form story to CNN. They might not want it. He might have to rejigger it to work for CBS or uh, 60 Minutes, rather, not CBS. So there you go. Good job, Anderson Cooper. Good job, uh, CNN, for actually branching out with your uh, programming because you definitely need it. This next one comes from Bloomberg, written by Ashley Carmen. Spotify has spent less than 10% of its $100 million diversity fund. The fund uh, was established, oh, geez, I think last year at some point. I don't remember, but it's a creator equity fund designed to promote diversity in music and podcasts following controversial comments by the company's star podcaster, Joe Rogan. Uh, and apparently they only spent less than 10% of it. It was a slow start because of uh, hiring staff and it suffered from shifting priorities. That's uh, because of Spotify. And uh, at the start of the year, the fund was still finalizing its 2023 budget and had yet to determine its priority projects. Another Spotify fund aimed at promoting diversity in podcasts suffered after that business was hit by layoffs last year. Spotify said Wednesday spending has exceeded $10 million, including funds for music, administration, and other areas. It has backed a number of initiatives in the first year, including Glow, which highlights the music from LGBTQ artists, and Nailing It, a podcast hosted by three black women. Sounds like they've only done two things. (laughs) The company this week announced an expanded partnership with Spelman College, a historically black women's uh, school in Atlanta. That will include scholarships and curriculum for students interested in podcasting. I uh, okay, so we we see these initiatives uh, with companies with media companies over the past uh, really since um, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor were murdered, and it is uh, unfortunately, I mean these these things were were responses to these these kinds of funds were responses to those those violent acts uh, against uh, people of color, and 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 in some ways and in some cases. It just seems kind of uh, frivolous just to announce, "Hey, we're going to do this," but then not do anything in the first, and like at like at all. 
Uh, the, I mean, this I, again, I'm going to keep harping on this until it is actually fixed. The same thing is said about Francis McDormand and uh, and the rest of the Hollywood elite. <laughs> when <laughs> speaking of sounding like Joe Rogan, um, when uh, when when she went up on that stage at the uh, at the Oscars, I, I think in 2021 or 2019, one of those years. But and she goes uh, one word inclusion writer and then everybody stood up you know you saw like all the Hollywood Chris is like clapping you saw people wiping tears away uh, and then no one did anything about it <laughs> except for Ava DuVernay and Michael B Jordan I it, it's just I it, it's just flabbergasting to see to see companies especially when Spotify spent millions excuse me millions and millions and millions of dollars on uh, uh, on Gimlet. And, and and other and um, uh, anchor which which I'm using for to to do the to do the soundboard and I, it, it's 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 frustrating to see these things be put kind of in bullet points and then not to be acted upon when they I mean when truly if you're gonna if you put a, if you put aside Apple puts aside a billion dollars to make TV shows. And for the past three years, we've seen them just ramp up production on TV shows and movies and and really invest into the interface, even if that means the uh, the Android TV version of the app uh, has to work on par with what the Apple TV version uh, is, uh, even though we don't have an Android uh, version for the phone. And and we and we you know, we, we've seen things like that. We've seen Microsoft take money and allocate it for Xbox Game Pass and and really just invest in that. We like we've seen companies grow and we know they can do this when they put their friggin' minds to it. But when you're when you're a Google, when you're a Spotify and you and you're and you say, hey, I want to, in Google's case, I want to do uh, four messaging platforms for some reason. And and then in three years, two of them are dead. And then one's on its way out. But maybe maybe the last one will be it, will be a cover all for all of them, which is what it should have been in the first place. So, I mean, take that and apply it to Spotify when, you know, you, you, you get probably one of the most controversial voices in media and you don't, you expect him to, you, you like you expect him not to say anything crazy and to play with your rules, and then you set up this fund because he says something crazy and doesn't play with your rules, and you don't act, you don't you don't do anything for it. I th- it's, it should be embarrassing for Spotify to, to to like if you're gonna if you're gonna say that you're gonna invest in into these areas, then do more than what you've already done. You, if it's a hundred million dollars, take. 10 million give it to you know 50 or 100 podcasts and just let them play and let them like people like let, let it be a, a, a podcast about people with uh, that are differently able podcast about people who were lgbtq uh black uh, uh korean uh, uh, uh mexican just uh, just give it just give it out just give out you know that money divvy up a tenth of that and then just let people do let people do a podcast and and show that there are different voices out there. And also, maybe take a million dollars and uh, to split a, split it into a Spotify podcast app instead of having it with the music app. Just saying. Uh, a recent study by McKinsey and Co. called for greater transparency in how companies allocate money to promote racial justice. Spotify announced the fund in February of last year after Neil Young pulled his music from the platform, citing Rogan's alleged spreading of uh, COVID-19 misinformation. It's not alleged. He definitely did spread misinformation. Employees at the company spoke out. And that year, the fund was seen, the $100 million fund, uh, was seen as symbolic since it matched the revenue of Rogan's contract. Yeah. Uh, Then the New York Times later pegged the deal at over, uh, his deal at over $200 million. At launch, the company divided the fund between music and podcasting. Teams were or organized to pitch ideas like hosting events for podcasters and musicians, creating new shows, and helping with marketing budgets. Months passed before Spotify hired employees, eight in total, who would ultimately oversee the journey. One job listing went live in November. The spokesperson said the company had a dedicated project manager assigned to the fund from the outset, working alongside other participating employees. I, I mean, if you're going to announce the fund, then I think 
you should promote from within. It should be, uh, I, I'm sure that they have people working at Spotify who would be willing to uh, not even just like shift their priorities, but to, uh, along with the eight people you're going to hire, to hop on board, on a board really, and just and just say, we have these voices that should need to be heard. We've been with this company for a long time versus outside people coming in and, and saying, you know, Spotify needs to do this and this, and then Spotify says, no, we can't do that. And then they go, well, okay, well, that's, <laughs> that's all we can say. It was designed to be used over three years, according to people uh, Bloomberg News spoke with, but the streaming service lacked a well-structured, clear system for vetting and approving projects or allocating money. I mean, again, that's just, you have to hire, hire, hire. You have to get, you have to get these, the eight spots filled before you even have anything go. And, and then at that point, if they announced it in February, they should have had people hired by May. Like, that's how fast they should, and, like, and that's slow to me. It should have been April. Uh, but they they should have had people hired before summer so that when it when when the initiatives start maybe winter time maybe that following January which would be this year then things would have progressed at a faster pace. Ideas were pitched often, but not often not accepted. Like I'm saying, the Spotify spokesperson pointed to various projects backed by uh, backed by the fund as evidence. The system is working and said the fund was designed for to last multiple couple of years, but uh, no specific time frame. The internal memo stated the fund's mission is to amplify the voices and work of prim- uh, primarily black and LGBTQ creators. I, I mean, I, I think it's in the U.S., U.K., and Brazil. Uh, I think you're going to have to push further than that, um, especially with that much money. Yeah, it's. I mean, again, it's just. It doesn't have to. It, it, they, like, all, not every project has to sound like the greatest thing in the world. You can definitely hire people who were and like kind of in my category, uh, who have like a lot of experience, but just haven't had a chance to you know really shine, uh, more or less. And you know, just just put a put a bunch of small teams together and 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 make it project based. It doesn't have to be the greatest things in the world. Just, I mean, truly, just do it. The spokesperson said the company also funds initiatives outside of that remit, like the Latinx space. I mean, it's still. Some of the projects cited in the memo are being backed by the fund, uh, such as the fourth season of the Pop Culture Podcast, We Said What We Said, which weren't new to the company. I and Again, that move, that move the money has to be used for things that are that are new, that are just... Because you, cause you already had... If you already had... Uh, shows that have been running and, and initiatives that have been running, that's great. Prop those up, but also bring in new initiatives. All right. Let's get diverse. Come on, Spotify. You, you got to know. You, you, you know what happens. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, this comes from Deadline written by Jake Cantor. BAFTA defends all white best actress, uh, best TV actress shortlist amid big drop in nominations for people of color. I've uh, I've had this issue with the British, uh, what is it called? BAFTAs, British uh, um, American, something like that. <laughs> the uh, what does BAFTA stand for? BAFTA. It's a British award ceremony, British Academy Film Awards. I've had this issue of with them for a very long time. I mean, even even in Hollywood, you know, there's at least some type of diverseness when it comes to uh, a, a, a movie and television nominations. But man, oh man, the Baftas—they're uh, I think they're they're a very big part. And yeah, I'll comfortably say this: I don't I don't want to go to England. I don't want to work in England. <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll remake Luther in American, and I'll do it. <laughs> and I said in American, <laughs> but the the problem with uh, the Baftas for a very long time is that it has been even more so than the Academy Awards and uh, the Emmys has been super duper pooper white. Baftas celebrated the number of older white women nominated for Best Actress as its television awards. Uh, at its television awards, rather, amid a steep decline in ethnic diversity in performance shortlist. Ethnic diversity just sounds horrible. All six nominees in the leading actress are white, 
and have been nominated for BAFTAs across film and television multiple times in the past. Asked if BAFTA had hopes for a different outcome, CEO Jane Millichip said there is representation in that category. Uh, she's talked about, oh, wow, are the roles written for women over the age of 40? That's a really impressive result. That's just, oh, my God. Whew. Representation for older women. I mean, it's, again, these, the all of these women have... I'm looking at the list, including Billy Piper and Kate Winslet. I mean, these people have had, have been, have been, you know, in the industry for a very long time, and they're and they're always going to get their due. They're always, always, always going to get their due. But when you when you have uh, 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 people who aren't being represented, I mean, it's just it's insane. And then we have to we have to not only do we have to talk about it once, but we have to keep talking about it and not just making the same jokes and references all the time. I'm talking about actually talking about it okay uh all six actresses are back to favorites deadline understands she was uh, okay uh yeah it's just uh, insane to say the drop in ethnic diversity follows concern over the bafta film awards when 47 of the 49 winners were white the only black uh star on stage was co-host Allison Hammond, who I believe is a soccer person. I believe is a soccer presenter. Wow, I am looking at the winners of the 2023 BAFTAs, and uh, it is it is the one of the whitest pictures I have seen uh, in a very long... Oh my God, it's so bright. <laughs> it is so bright. Yeah, it's 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 getting to be uh, very disappointing. I mean, and and it's not like it's not like people are asking to be. The thing is, we're not we're not just saying nominate for diversity's sake or and vote for for diversity's sake. Uh, th- I think, in particular, this year has been or this past year rather has been uh, fantastic for representation on screen. I'm not just talking about black people and gay people. I'm talking about queer people. I'm talking about uh, uh, for for uh, Chinese people, for uh, Mexicans, for uh, uh, Japanese, for Indians. It's, I, I mean, for, for people from the Middle East, for Muslims, for Jewish people. I mean, we're seeing, we're just seeing a flood of, of, of great, great projects with people who can be represented on screen and we only give notice. We only pay attention to the white Lotus. We only pay attention to, uh, uh, hacks. It, it just, it, it's, it's frustrating to see the same things over and over again, but to see, you know, somebody clap at, at the Academy Awards because Jimmy Kimmel made a seventh joke about Will Smith and, and Chris Rock. I'd love to see his writer's room again. I don't think it's very diverse. Uh, it's probably one of his cousins. <laughs> All right, and this final thing comes from Ars Technica, written by Kyle Orland and The Completionist on YouTube. Today, the day that I'm recording this, Monday, March 27th, is the last day you can buy anything on the Nintendo 3DS and Wii U eShop. And the importance of Game Archival has come up again because the closure of these of these shops will definitely, especially for uh, the eShop, for, excuse me, especially for the 3DS eShop, it'll, it'll lock games out from ever being purchased ever again. Uh, it'll keep people from experiencing, uh, and a lot of, and and I would say in like ninety nine percent of the cases, th- some of the games, like I mean, all of these games, like it's it's crazy. Like I don't I don't think there's not a lot of 3ds games that have made their way to the Switch or just off of the 3ds system. It's I mean, sure we can play Pokemon Crystal from you know the year two thousand and two. But I think that's wrong. But uh, we're like it's going to be hard unless you pirate games to uh, to play uh, uh, Pokemon X and Y because there's nowhere else to play that. It's going to be hard to to play uh, Kirby Robobot. Is that what it's called? Uh, and uh, Fire Emblem Awakening and and other games of that ilk. 
I think maybe like what games what games have made it off the three the three DS and the DS. Um, I uh, Donkey Kong Country Returns 3D maybe I don't know if that was put into Tropical Freeze I don't know I have yet to beat Tropical Freeze a game I own on Switch and I have yet to beat it but I think I got it for like like twenty or thirty dollars on a rare buy one get one sale at or buy two get one sale at uh, Target I got that and New Super Mario Brothers U Switch. Or New Super Mario Brothers. Yes, you, you Switch. You Deluxe, whatever it's called. And uh, something else. Because I got... Th- yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. Anyway, there are people out there who are who are looking to to archive these games for future... I mean, like, there's a, there's a whole... There's a whole... Um, uh, act. What is it called? A, a whole organization that, that does video game... Uh, not copyright. Video game... Uh, preservation but the challenge is there are headaches with the digital millennium copyright act which uh prevents i'm reading from this Ars technica article from kyle orland uh which prevents people from making copies of any drm protected digital work and if you are a nintendo fan uh you know or like even if you just like watch a nintendo review on youtube you'll see that if they even if people aren't partners with nintendo they'll They'll take down the review like that or the video like that. The U.S. Copyright Office has issued exemptions for the rules to allow libraries and research institutions to make digital copies for archival purchases. Those organizations can even distribute archived digital copies of items like ebooks, DVDs, and even generic computer software to researchers through online access systems. But those systems leave out video games. So now we have people uh, like the strong museum of play who have tried to, who have maintained all current 3DS and Wii U eShop copies that quote, the only way anyone could ever legally play or study those games is if they flew to Rochester, signed a consent form and sat in the premises playing it. Jesus. Then there's other places like the, what is video game history foundation? That they've uh, or have tried to archive all of the games themselves. There's a you can you can access if you go to Internet Archive, which is a very, it's a legal archive of uh, everything. It's a library online. Um, it's archive.org. You can there's a lot of games on there that you can download because they are uh, legally emulated on there. But Nintendo doesn't want to be part of that online arcade. They don't want you playing their games for free, which is understandable. Uh, however, I think, I think the only I used to when I when I was younger, uh, and I didn't have any money, I would I would uh, uh, download uh, movies and TV shows and games. And then when I got money, as an adult, you know, in college, then and then and then streaming came about, and then things just became so much easier. You know, you could go to Redbox and rent a DVD instead of downloading the latest movie or watching it online. Uh, and now and now everything's just so easy to get that there's no reason that people should have to or even want to uh, illegally obtain anything. Uh, now, however, I've uh, that, so so I've been like very strict about that for the past couple of years. But then now with things like this, it kind of makes me go, OK, well. I mean, I want to be able to play Fire Emblem Awakening at some point, and I don't have ninety dollars to spend on a copy. Preservationists, the Copyright Office, has sided with the uh, entertainment, oh, excuse me, with the ESA and other industry groups during a uh, 2021 rulemaking process. Researchers who want to legally access professionally archived game collections still have to travel to wherever those collections are stored. Now, the completionist over on his YouTube channel got uh, his crew together, uh, which include, I think it was like eight guys, who uh, throughout the course of several months of work just downloaded games across one 3DS and one Wii U because that's how Nintendo still operates. 
and and like I think it was something like dozens of uh, SD cards across both systems, and you can only download one game at a time, and you could only add so many funds to your uh, Wii U eShop or to your eShop period. And then you had to download DLC one at a time. And then for a lot of 3DS games, you could only you could uh, only download uh, DLC at certain points within the game. So for instance, like Fire Emblem uh, Awake or Birthright, rather, you uh, Conquest or Birthright. It's the same thing. In order to download the DLC that came with that game or that that came after that game, you had to get like two hours into the game and then you could download it, which is which is an insane you know step uh, process for these things to happen. I, I I mean it's and now and now they completed the goal. They have every single game that from the 3DS and the Wii U, but I it's just it's so crazy. I understand that that it is like people like that companies don't want their games to be played for free or, or you know, the ROMs uh, or emulators to, to, to have anything to do with, with uh, I don't know, with the games or whatever. But I just, I, I just, if, especially if a game has been delisted, like in modern day now uh, on the, the, the PlayStation store or on the Xbox store, uh, it's, it's, it sucks because, you know, you have to, you like for a lot of times, you just want to go back and, and just play a game that you remember from that you grew up with or or compare it to the latest iteration of that game. If I want to go back and play Forza Horizon 1, a game which I own, so thankfully I can download it to my Xbox at any time. But if I didn't own it prior to that uh, I, and I was willing to spend, you know, $15 to go download it, uh, but then I went, I went to the storefront and it's not there – then that would just be frustrating because I want to because what if what if Forza Horizon Six comes out and I, and I and I go oh man I've never played the first one let me go back and, and check it out and I don't own the game and I and I'm and I'm up the creek without a paddle I mean it, it's just I mean everything should be and this is I did I was not a Bernie fan when uh, when he was running I was Elizabeth Warren uh, but I think that if everything should be available to everybody and the only thing stopping uh, uh, everybody from you know watching Succession season four on HBO Max or uh, from playing Pokemon X on a 3DS is just purchasing it legally directly from the source or or, or, or subscribing legally to you know HBO Max directly from the source. Uh, and like the the option should not be to hey I haven't seen Lloyd in space it's not on Disney Plus. I got. I'm going to go to YouTube and Google, or and then put in Lloyd in space and watch the three episodes that someone illegally uploaded there. It just sucks. It sucks, and uh, it should not come to that. Anyway, all right. Listen, we're done here. If you like what you heard here, head to the website cpluscomedy.com where you can see me talk to your favorite comedians like Jenny Zagrino. Just put out that one. Put out that one. Uh, I got another one coming up. I already re- uh, interviewed her. I already interviewed. Um, the the uh, this most recent person and hopefully if another one comes in then I can put that one with this the other one because uh, it's a little short uh you can f- if you want to see a video version of the show head to the website youtube.com slash he's most comedy where you can see a video version of this show you can see a plate that had a donut on it in the background you can see uh last week when it was Freezing cold in Atlanta, Georgia. You can see a cardigan sitting on a chair, uh, but now it's warm. It's hot as balls. Uh, you can and you can see me sitting on a Monday at twelve forty one in my office chair. <laughs> oh, excuse me, my dining room chair, my dining room slash office chair. YouTube.com slash people's comedy, as well as the if you want to see video versions of the other podcasts which include Late Night Lately, the Late Late Night Show show on uh, that as well. Uh, it's a late night show, not recap. I just talk about the things that are good. And I have a monologue and I do jokes. And then uh, uh, LinkedIn Logs, which is our premier business podcast, which is where I try to become a LinkedIn influencer slash only fan. That. You can also subscribe to all of the podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, 
and TikTok at C Plus Comedy. Follow me on those platforms at Chad Black White. Rate, review, subscribe. Tell your friends about the show, and we're going to go goodbye.